And we're live, maybe sort of. Uh, Stabby hasn't stabbed him, so this is a win today. But uh, hey, are you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans? It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction in the fear in Skynet. So without further ado, we are going to let our guests introduce themselves. So we're going to go in alphabetical order because I can pretend I know how to read. And we're going to start with Mr. J. Daniel Sawyer. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? Uh, Sawyer, I also write as Dan Sawyer and as J.D. Sawyer. I write mysteries, science fiction, and nonfiction. Most recently, I published um, The Secrets of the Heinlein, Robert's Rules of Writing, which are in-depth studies of uh, the Heinlein Juvenile as pioneered by Robert Heinlein and continued by others, and, and of uh, his rules in publishing in business. Okay. Uh, next we have... Uh, I blog Mr. on geopolitics and all sorts of other stuff. Sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, next we have Mr. Joe Vasicek, and maybe I even pronounced that right today. You did. It's, it's Vasicek like cash a check. So I actually got to... Uh, anyways... I got a chance to go back to the motherland for a little uh, earlier this summer. That was fun with my sister. Uh, she's really into Czech research, but I write science fiction and fantasy, uh, mostly sci-fi under my Joe Vass Czech name. And i um, been doing this for a little while. It's mostly indie published. I've got a few things with some semi prosemes here and there. Um, but yeah, I like to tell lies for a living and just trying to, you know, make that and do that. And so that's, that's basically what I do. Outstanding. And then last but not least, we have returning guest, Mr. Rick Shaw, author, tech consultant, and all-around decent dude. Yeah, Rick Shaw. Um, I write sci-fi, uh, post-apocalyptic, a little paranormal, uh, some other fun stuff. Uh, for the past 30 years, I paid the bills uh, running IT and higher ed from the UC to the CSU and community colleges in California. Um, I retired out of that in uh, November I do a little consulting on the side, mostly in higher ed and municipalities, um, but mostly I like to write. And I published my first novel this past June, and I'm hoping to have the next one out uh, somewhere towards the end of September. Outstanding. Uh, and since you said what genre you write in, Dan, but you didn't say what book or series you're known for, uh, what, what's your most prominent series that you're writing? Oh, God, there's so many. Um, I got my traction thesis progression in podcast fiction, my nine, currently eight book, soon to be ten book, uh, Clark Lantham mystery series, and the trilogy called Suave Rob's Awesome Adventures, which is about a far future evil Knievel who does all sorts of crazy adrenaline junkie shit and keeps accidentally becoming a hero, even though he doesn't want to be. Okay, it's a, it's a really amazing audiobook and um, amazing commercial that you had done by... Yeah. Uh, who was that? I know that Dave Robinson. Oh, he did such a good job with the audio. Kind of I literally wrote it, it was a stand, it was supposed to be a standalone novella, and his read of the first one was so good. I actually wrote the next two books just so I could hear him read them. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. And he did a commercial. I throw that in sometimes just because I like the way the commercial sounds. I mean, even if it's not nice. like a mix for the for the episode, because sometimes we try to pair like the whatever type of book we're talking about with the whatever the commercial is. But sometimes we throw yours in just because I like his voice. And if well, you like coffee, you. he runs Corpse Coffee as well, so you can get some dead. Yes, in your he coffee. does. And he runs one and in, Wonder Thing Studios also. I think he, they they produce a lot of podcasts, or at least used to. I've been out of the loop for the last year or so. Yeah, you He's moved up into the mountains, so. If your yep. uh, if your bandwidth keeps dropping, you can turn your camera off. It'll lower it. It should it should help. Um, your call at, at that point. All right. And Joe, what are you most known for writing? You mentioned genres, but not the the series. Um. Let's see. Well, I've written a few things uh, you may have heard of. I've written these days. I've written writing a lot of short stories lately, and I do a thing where I release them uh, for free and keep them out for about six months, and then take them down. And then I have enough. I bundle them into a collection. So anytime you, you want to check out my short stories, if you can see what ones I've got out right now. But I've written, uh, let's see, I wrote a series, a space opera series, uh, Sons of the Starfarers. And that was kind of a spinoff of, of the um, Star Wanderers series that um, you read back in the day, um, JR. And uh, I've combined all those into one novel, and now I'm turning that, that into a trilogy. 
I've got a couple other trilogies. Um, the one, my first novel that I published was uh, Genesis Earth. And I uh, just the last couple of years finished that trilogy. Uh, it only took me about 10 years to finally get to a point where I was able to write the last book or the last two books. But I think they turned out pretty good. And um, I've actually just finished and I'm, will be publishing a an AI assisted novel. Uh, it's called The Riches of Zolthar. I'm actually publishing that um, chapter by chapter in my blog right now. And that should be coming out in September. So that'll be a little topical, I guess. So it's been a, an interesting experience writing that. He likes to experiment with things just for the fun of it because it tickles his brain. So he does the things. Um, do you think you'll ever turn your uh, the your fantasy short story, A Hill Upon Which to Die, into an actual novel? It's a good question. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I, uh, prob- I don't have any plans for that, but if people are interested, we'll see. Are you interested in that? I, I would. I'd read it. I'd dig the short story. Uh, for Dan, I-, I know him more for reading his nonfiction, so... Uh, <laughs> I haven't, I'm not a mystery guy. I cheat on mysteries and I read the end just to know who did it. And then I'm done. But I, I buy it when I do well, that. If you want two of, two, two of mine that you will love, JR. One is uh, Hadrian's Flight, which is a, uh, takes place in the 22nd century about a kid on the moon who manufactures wingsuits. And then uh, The Wolf of Venus, which is at the Substack right now. And it's uh my editor describes it as 1984 meets a clockwork orange in space, but for kids. So we actually, you know, that makes me think there's a topic, Nick, we could do is uh, people that inv- invent future sports. So like his is the idea is the, the wingsuits because it's in zero grav and they're playing a sport around that. We could probably make that an episode about like it's going to be hard to top rollerball. Yeah, I mean, that's that's <laughs> but it could be an interesting discussion. I actually oh, yeah. bought, about future sports. I actually bought a signed copy of that book, Dan, but my son stole it from me, and I haven't seen it oh, back. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, he liked it, but he won't give it back. So, oops. I mean, I guess I just have to buy another one. <laughs> what if you say you'll do twenty push-ups for him to get the book back, pay the ransom? Yeah, that's what I got to do. <laughs> so, all right. So, with that being said, uh, the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we found them. So, I was actually, when I started, uh, Nick and I were planning this episode on AI and the creative future. Uh, Skynet reached out to us and basically said, these are the guests you will invite. Uh, if they disappear after this episode, Nick and I had nothing to do with it. We have plausible deniability. But I'm just saying, these are the people they wanted us to bring. So, I don't know what that means, but we're just going to obey our robot over I'm getting... I'm getting shades of Rocco's Basilisk in this. Uh... <laughs> I well, mean, they, they, they took all my Star Wars memorabilia and said they'd give it back after we brought these guests on. So and I'm like, I love crying. He was, he was, crying. He was, crying. was crying. It was, it was ugly, ugly cry. Not not like the cute girl cry. It was the ugly cry. It was like six year old skins his knee on the scooter cry. Like and I was like, <laughs> but, but not even skin his knee on the scooter. It was skin his knee on the scooter when someone's watching cry because that's totally like next level. Oh. Yeah, the embarrassment. Yeah, okay, that yeah, one. Yeah. It was definitely it. It was ugly. We should have filmed it, but thank God we didn't. Oh, I, I think Stabby did, but maybe she's holding that range. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. I'm sorry, Stabby. You don't know it, but she's actually got a knife in her lap, people. It's it's just we got to maintain our, our manners here. It gets ugly really, really quickly. Ow, too close. <laughs> All right, so uh, Dan and Joe, you guys have not been on recently. I think both of you were on when we were uh, sci-fi shenanigans, and then again in season one. And since it's been a while, you guys both get to answer the religion question. So we're going to start with you, Joe. Uh, okay. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Uh, well, I'm not a communist. No, no, just kidding. Uh, I would say Star Wars, uh, Star Wars original trilogy, strictly original trilogy. Okay, that's a solid answer. Um, and what about Game of Thrones, The Wheel of Time, or Lord of the Rings, Joe? Oh, I just started reading The Wheel of Time, actually. I'm in book three now. Um, it's a big series. I would say uh, Lord of the Rings. I'm more of a kind of old school fantasy that way. But my my actually, no, no, I, I take that back. I just reread for the second time all the original Conan stories by Robert E. Howard. Robert E. Howard is amazing. Did you read any of the, the Conan stories, too? Like the, the knockoffs <laughs> of Conan? I'm reading some right now. There's actually there's quite a few good ones. Um, some of them are kind of eh, um, but the Lynn, one I'm Lynn reading Carter. right now. Yeah, I'm reading one by uh, it's Conan the Marauder. It's I forget who wrote who writes that one. It's uh, but that, that's a really good one. Um, I actually, I mean, the ones by um, 
what is it, Lynn Carter and El Sprague de Camp. They're kind of older and a little bit cornier, but I actually, I actually really enjoy them too. So slightly different reasons than the Robert E. Howard ones, but the Howard ones are really just amazing, really good. Did you ever um, get into the Marvel comics? Uh, I have not gotten the comp gotten to the comics yet. I own a copy of David Gemmel's um, Legend, the uh, graphic novel. My wife got yeah. that for me because I'm I'm slowly collecting everything that David Gemmel ever wrote. He's my favorite writer of all time. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. I need to need to read that one again. But yeah. So did you read any of Robert Jordan's? Uh, I understand he you know the, the Wheel of Time guy. I understand he did some Conan books as well. I read one. Well, I started the one, and I was kind of like, "Yeah, I don't know about this one." Um, but I need to poke around and read a few other ones. But um, he's a good writer. It was a little bit kind of, I don't know, like some of the more, I mean, some of the more content issues. I mean, I like the gritty with uh, Robert E. Howard and kind of the adventure stuff. But when it gets into kind of the weird sexual stuff, that's kind of like, I mean, and a lot of the. Um, that's why I would say Game of Thrones is kind of, eh, not really, but yeah. Okay. So what about you, Dan? Uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, or Firefly? I'm a total heathen, and uh, I have to go with Babylon 5. Yeah. Okay, that's that's acceptable. <laughs> um, so does, it, does this mean you like the, uh, the Star Wars ripoff, knockoff, I mean homage that was uh, Deep Space Nine? Um, actually, Deep Space Nine was okay. Wasn't as good as Babylon 5, but it did enough of a different thing that I enjoyed it. But I haven't been able to go back to it, so it worked well once through. Um, I actually really, really love the original and the prequel trilogy of Star Wars, but uh, nothing after that. Okay, okay. And um, Wheel of Time, uh, Game of Thrones, or Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings, absolutely. Read that for the first time when I was eight years old, read it every three years since. Does it take you three years to finish it, or do you read other stuff in between? <laughs> no, I read other stuff in between, but it's 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 such a wonderful book. There's so much depth there that when you space it out over time, every time you read it, it's a different book. Wow. What are your thoughts on uh, Silmarillion? Oh, it's gorgeous. I that did, took me three years to get it, through. It's virtually <laughs> unreadable, but I cracked the code of how to read it when I heard a recording of Tolkien reading a portion of it, and I realized that it's not written to be read. It's written to be heard. So if you get the audiobook by Martin Shaw, it is some of the most glorious, most of it's in blank verse too. It's some of the most glorious epic poetry you will ever hear. Okay. No, so I agree. It I, it, it's, a, it's hard to get through. So apparently I need to try it with the audiobook. Hmm. I, I know when it comes to poetry, I, I've, uh, the kid, I've looked at his syllabus for ninth grade. And uh, Beowulf is on there. I'm like, oh, I haven't read that in a while. So I'm going to be hitting that with him, mostly mm -hmm. as an excuse just to read it again anyway. Uh, check out Tolkien's translation of Beowulf. It is astonishing. Is it different than the standard one? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's, it's still the same story, but Tolkien's facility with language, he brings a lot more of the flavor of the original rhythms of the words through. And it is beautiful. Yeah. I like the uh, old Anglo. Like apparently they did, they dram with like alliteration instead of at the end of each at the end of each mm -hmm. word. And they do things yep. like kennings where it's like a two word, like the whale road stuff like that. My wife, uh, she was a linguistics major in college, got a bachelor got a bachelor's in that, and uh, she took a class where everybody basically translated Beowulf. So nice. So as a linguistics major, does it mean she's going to make up her own language and write the uh, the next epic fantasy novel series? Well, she took a different track, and now she's actually getting her PhD in uh, computer science with language learning models. So it actually gets right on topic with the. Uh, <laughs> the okay. Well, I mean, so it's her fault. So, <laughs> I think so. so she could have gone down the road that got you guys your own Amazon series and you know a few money, but instead, you want to play with robots? That's cool. <laughs> I mean, that's a quicker probably payout than the the Lord of the Rings approach, but I mean, because he had yeah. to die first, but. We'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. Speaking of AI, since we've danced around the issues, so it's been all over the news lately about AI and all of the creative endeavors, be it being used to write books, being used to replace actual art for visual art content, and also being um, used to create audiobooks. Um, so before we dive in, does anybody have an opinion, and we can just sort of round robin this going forward? Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly on using these as tools, uh, or are you totally against them? 
I've, I think they are so young yet, the jury's way out on what they're capable of and what they'll get to. I look at them as a tool, um, no different than Grammarly, which is now using OpenAI on the back end um, and some others. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when spell check and, and early grammar check came out in word processing and there was the wailing and gnashing of teeth then. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking a wait and see attitude. Um, I'm more, I'm less enthused on the visual art side than I am the word side. Um, uh, but, uh, we'll see. I'm actually, uh, well, so 10 years ago when I was first getting into uh, indie publishing, I was wondering about this because I heard some rumors that AI might one day become, you know, and I was looking into the long term, like I want to, I want to build a career that's, you know, a long term career with writing. And, um, and I thought about it, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I realized, okay, a couple things. First of all, the important thing is not that, well, the important thing is the people are reading my books that they're reading, they want to read, they're reading it because they want to read a Joe Vasicek book. Mm -hmm, right. And only really I can write a Joe Vasicek book. Um, I might be able to write it with the AI tools, but there's, there's gotta be the secret sauce there. It's gotta, it's gotta feel like a Joe Vasicek book. It's gotta preserve the voice and everything else. And the other thing I realized was the question is not really whether the AI will replace you and be scared and run around and everything about that. It's more that the AI is kind of a, it's a force multiplier. And the real question is who owns the AI? And so if we do get to it, so back 10 years ago, I, I thought, well, if we ever do get to a point where AI can potentially write a book better than most writers can write a book, um, then I have to get my hands on that and figure out how to do that and actually own one of those or, or you know, be able to use that. And if I could do that, then, um, you know, basically I'm letting the AI work for me instead of work against me, instead of being like, you know, stuck in, oh, I'm just going to do it this way because I've always done it and writing and competing against other people who are putting out lots of books because they've embraced the AI. I need to actually learn how to embrace the AI and, AI and work that into uh, how I do things. So I've been doing a lot of experimentation with AI lately and uh, AI assisted yeah. writing and found some really interesting things from that. But, and then wrote my first novel with it too, which has been- Most really of the user licensing online, like pseudo write, um, say that the copyright and rights ownership is that of the licensee. So if I do something in pseudo write, um, that's my copy and my content. It's not the AIs. Yeah, the the case law on it is really interesting because it's pulling two directions. It pulls it, it, it either goes to the uh, person using the tool or it goes to the public domain. And there's two traditions of case law that are about to intersect and it's going to be really, really ugly. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms, of, I haven't played around with it much myself, but I've been watching everything play out. And one of the things that's occurred to me is that the long-term effect is that it's going to turn the arts back into an aristocratic pursuit. Hmm. Because the only humans eventually that are going to be able to compete are the ones that have the willingness to invest the time over 20 or 30 years to get really, really good. Uh, because there's not going to be a lot of the lower level writing jobs or art jobs that uh, allow you to build a career stepwise like it's been over the course of the 20th century. It's going to go back much more to how it used to be during the Renaissance where the folks that had the uh, had the time and the luxury to spend a lot of time developing their, their art were the ones that finally were able to get patronage or find audiences and that kind of thing. I don't think it was so much luxury or time. I just sacrificed sleep and food so I can work on my art. <laughs> well, that counts too. <laughs> you know, like I, I mean, I, I, I moved up to developing a craft that, yeah. like, it's almost like a. Is it John Henry versus the uh, the wood cutting machine? Yeah, or, or it's like uh, artisanal blacksmithing versus anything you can buy mass produced. Say it's going to be the same kind of model. Yeah, no, I I literally moved up to a patch of bare land in the mountains so that I could afford the time to do yep. writing without having to take as many side jobs. That's an investment well done, in my opinion. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun because AI yeah. does like to wrestle bears. So there's that. It's one way to stay young. Um, so I, sure. I don't know, I, I've noticed, so I'm managing a couple, um, working with three Ravens anthologies for them. So I've been reaching out to authors that, you know, you would want to be your anchor author, your headliner. And I've actually had a couple of them say, you know, sure, that sounds fun, but I don't want to be on any, any book that has an, an AI contributed cover. And it got me thinking because on the one hand, like, 
if I had my druthers, I would pay an artist to do the cover because I think you get better results. But uh, for like short content, if I had to pay, you know, the going rate for get a cover artist, I'd never make it back. I just can't afford to put my short content out there, right? Um, because the the cost investment. Whereas if I can use a AI generated cover really quickly, and then if it takes off, you know, you got the money, you go and hire better covers. But as a starting point, the barrier entry is low. And all of that is happening right as the economy is tanking, everything is getting more expensive. And so consequently artists are raising their prices while then you have the competing downward pressure of the AI generated art. And it's just like, it, it's a crapshoot because then it makes it, like you said, the big houses that can afford staff artists are, are doing okay. Whereas the little independent ones are sort of either using AI or falling away. So it's definitely something to think about. I know there's some, and Nick and I talked about this off show when we were planning this episode, there is some consideration on where the art is learning from and whether those artists are being compensated. Um, Nick, you had, you had some strong rising from? Yeah. Yeah. You had some strong opinions on that. Did you want to weigh in on the art side? Yeah. Well, um, this will be fun. Because as an artist, I, AI is cheap. It's most cases free if you go to the right website. So, yep. but all the AI is doing is it's it's taking since it has access to the collective wealth of human knowledge and artistry, same as everybody else, but it can do it at seconds, you know, terabytes and seconds and stuff like that. So it, it it generates an image based on things that it found on the web. So I'm and I see this a lot. There's a lot of comic book artists right now that are trying to go to go to the dark side, the quick and easy path, as Vader did. And they're finding out that they're getting a lot of feedback because those of us that have spent decades learning this skill set just tear it apart creatively. It's like the ad the anatomy is wrong, the perspective is wrong, you know. And those are two things that you can't fake. Now I can fake a little bit of I can fake a little bit, but the human eye is always going to catch it, you know. And then you just play it off as like, oh well, you know, that's kind of like my style. And then we all accept that. It's like, okay, that's the artist style on his anatomy. That's how he does stuff. But when every AI generated image that I've seen, the anatomy's off. It's got like nine fingers if it's someone holding a fist, or it's got two fingers. Um, the perspective's off. So if you do the vanishing lines and all the the mathematics to it, it's not right because it's pulling from multiple images to assemble almost a puzzle of what you asked it to do. And that's where you're getting this big problem right now in Hollywood. That's why they're striking is because they wanted the studios want to use AI to not only write the movies and the TV shows and all that stuff, but they want to use CGI generated by AI. So no human input whatsoever to recreate characters and the voice them and just all of that and not compensate where they stole all that stuff from. Because I'm just going to say they stole it because they did. Nobody asked me to use part of my stuff for their generated image. You know, and I got a lot of artwork out there. So I'm not a big fan of AI until either one, the artists get credit or they start generating shit that they didn't have to pull from anybody else. They actually have a creative thought. And I think that's possible in advancements in AI. It can eventually develop imagination instead of just hard input. But until we reach that point, I'm, I'm completely against it. So that's the other thing that, that you talk about stolen some of the contracts and this has been coming up specifically with audiobooks i've been seeing it some of the contracts are having those little hidden clauses because most people don't read the terms of service and always so, read the terms of service always read the terms of service so as you go um and you look up and that's actually a, a plot idea nobody read the terms of service and then insert shenanigans and you could have some dystopian stories right there but i digress um a lot of people aren't realizing they're actually unintentionally licensing with specifically like audiobooks their voice to these AI generators because there's a box they not that they click they have to unclick it to not give permission because they're trying to sneak it in and assuming nobody's going to look and I know Dan you actually make audiobooks so that's going to hit close to home for you yeah, yeah that uh, that uh, tre um, treads and likeness rights territory which pisses me off it um, the the thing where the AI is learning from the performances and from the art of others. Um, and from the books of others, that doesn't bother me so much because that's the way everybody learns. Um, the the place where where I start to get annoyed is where they're where they're stealing likeness rights, 
or uh, finding ways to, to, to rip them out in sub clauses. Um, you know, long term, the last last 20 years have seen a steady move away from the organic and into the artificial in a way that uh, destroys art. And this, I think, is just going to um, just going to accelerate that trend. But what's the res the results financially for the studios that are doing this, large and small, has been a collapse of income. Uh, because the more humanity you rip out of the arts, the less entertaining they get, even out of the lowbrow pulpy stuff. And there's going to be, I think, a uh, there's going to be a natural stratification between the stuff that AI does and the stuff that humans do. And eventually you may not even need to brand it as human because as Nick was saying, the human eye, the human ear, they can hear things that are very, very difficult to quantify mathematically, if not impossible at this stage, because they rely on chaotic mathematics, which the AIs have trouble dealing with. The, the computational power involved is far too vast. It'll only be if quantum computing actually breaks out that that'll be attainable for them. So um, the the ba I see the balance of audience fragmenting. The, the same trend we've seen where as indie publishing comes out, the audience for big publishing is just fragmented and devolved down a layer because uh, the crust at the large publishing companies, the cultural niche and worldview gatekeeping is so narrow because all the editors come from the same schools, the same socioeconomic backgrounds. And you know, there's that old Atlantic uh, cover of New York City, seen from Manhattan. There's New York, it's the whole world, and then there's the Hudson River, and then there's a little bitty strip of the rest of the planet. That's how things look to any gatekeeper class if it's pulled from too narrow a selection of the population. And that's been happening since about 2005, especially. It's been happening in New York and Hollywood. And this is going to accelerate and dehumanize that trend even more, which is going to push a lot more of the audience, at least the audience that is interested in entertainment instead of just going on to TikTok, down a few levels to the layer of us uh, indies. But it's also going to make them harder to find because we won't be able to go to, say, the audience for Star Wars and go, hey, guys, if you like Star Wars but think it's gone a little shit, you're going to love what I'm doing. So you actually hit on something unintentionally is when you mentioned TikTok is the role AI is playing not just in creating the content, but determining what we view through the algorithm selection processes, mm -hmm. because it's not just what is created, but what you can find. Yeah. And programs like TikTok are pushing certain uh, video content ahead and pushing others down in the algorithm such that that's, certain things are finding traction. Well, I'm, I'm that's, that's, no different, that's no different than what Google's been doing with its search results or Facebook's been doing with theirs. You know, their their yeah. job is to sell eye space and sell, sell eyes on content, um, which is why I very rarely see posts from my wife on Facebook. That is, a, that is an issue. Maybe I would like to go back and address something real quick. The... Um, I do agree when it comes to um, author's consent as to whether their um, or author's consent or artist's consent as to whether their content is being used to train these models. I do agree that's, that that is definitely an ethical issue, something we need to look at. There is this kind of meme that's getting repeated over and over on like Facebook and other places like that. And it's, it's become kind of an article of faith that people accept. And I think it's worth addressing because it's completely false that um, chat GPT and other models are, are plagiarizing. Um, no, they're not. It's not plagiarism because the way the model actually works, it basically, it takes a very, very large corpus of work, like incredibly large, like Project Gutenberg is not large enough to train a language learning model. Um, and I'm just speaking to language learning models because that's, that's what I'm familiar with more than the visual stuff. But um, it takes a huge body of work. It looks for patterns and then it uses those patterns to create something. Yeah, it basically um, does predictive text on a grand scale. Yeah, it's and, like massive, yeah, massive predictive text. One of the things that I've been I've been interested in is the couple or three authors who are out there now trying to sue OpenAI and ChatGPT and others for violating copyright. Yeah. <clears throat> well, with the adaptive work that this does and how much of their stuff is out there by way of snippets and clips and interviews 
and reviews that gets pulled in, how much of that's copyrighted and how much is it? And how do you mm-hmm. prove that I read their novel and I'm giving back a summary of their novel because of that copyrighted piece of material? I don't see a how you can do it. But, no. but and, and even if you could, you've got the substantially transformative clause in copyright law, which yes. governs fair use. And there's no way to get around that. As far think, at least with the ways the law, the way the laws are currently written, I don't think you can get around that. Yeah. I think what's happened, um, and this is just my two cents, um, I think what happened was there were a lot of authors who got spooked when ChatGPT came out and it was a lot better than people were expecting. Uh, and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we might get a place. And then they found out that their works were being pulled to train the model and they got really angry. They started saying they stole from us, which, okay, that's kind of a gray area that they might have, they might have not, like, depend on how, what that means. But then that kind of got repeated. They stole, they stole, they stole. And then it, people were like, oh, that's plagiarism. And then everyone's saying, oh, that's obviously plagiarism. It's definitely plagiarism. And anyone who says that just doesn't know how a language learning model actually works. Right. And that's that's the, the thing that I want to say. There is an ethical question. There's a question of who owns what and how. Um, there are definitely ethical questions about that. But plagiarism is something very specific, and that's not what these models are doing. And there's another there's another angle, too, that le- those two legal traditions that are heading at loggerheads, the one that's got the most muscle behind it is the one that relegates anything, anyone who's not a human, into the public domain. And if that tradition wins, the whole landscape changes because the financial incentives to use OpenAI are going to go out the window for anything artistic because you can't own what it produces. So the studios are going to, the large corporations are going to back the fuck off from that really fast because they won't be able to control the IP once they release it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, there's an instance, like, I I talk from the art side of the house because that's what I know. Um, Now, say I was being used to train the AI for a certain thing with characters I'd drawn. Now, my style is derivative from everything I've studied throughout my entire life. So now who gets credit? Like, is it Jim Lee? Is it Neil Adams? Is it Mark Silvestri? Is it Rob Liefeld? Todd McFarland? You know, the list goes on and on because all of our styles... Is derivative. it Pythagoras who invented the rules of proportion that we all follow now? I mean, if you trace us artists back, I mean, we all probably sync up around like Rembrandt or something like that, depending on our styles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so now you got you got kind of that question. It's like, well, who? We, what we've we been talking about, who owns it? So if someone comes and takes one of my characters and, and puts in Nick Garber art style, well, crap. My art style is a combination of these artists that I followed and admired over the years, I've trained myself to do that, to make that hodgepodge, if you will, you know, of what makes Nick Garber's style, Nick Garber's style. No. So, so like it, it raises so many damn questions, but using it as a tool, like Rick was saying, is totally fine. It's like, cause there's poses that just haven't been calculated on film or imagery. Like I need, I need this acrobatic hero to be twisted and contorted in such a way that, it hasn't been drawn or painted or caught on film or created in CGI until I create it. Then well, I, I spent time today talking a couple of faculty off the cliff because they were all up in arms about AI and students using it to 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 cheat on their exams or their written work. <laughs> and my first thought was fine. Go back to blue books and handwritten essays. Yeah, yeah you're done. Exactly. And they both looked at me and went. What's a blue book? <laughs> well, no, no. It's like, I have to read their handwriting? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the other side of it is you're also inc- encouraging these students to use tools like Grammarly and Pro Writing Aid and others, which are back-ended by OpenAI. So, and they totally rip the soul out of your prose anyway. You've got, so, you know, you're... you're, you're you're not making sense here. Oh, by the way, your favorite tool for detecting plagiarism, turn it in, is uh-huh. licensing open AI. AI to identify <laughs> AI generated content. I just had to Google what prose was. Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. So, so before You're we get before we get too deep, we're going to one specify that when Joe and uh, Dan were talking about uh, laws, they were all we're all Americans, so we're coming at it from the American jurisprudence. Uh, that doesn't yes. mean that's necessarily how things are going to be uh, interpreted internationally although there is a lot of similarities i am not a lawyer just we're not no, neither am i i'm no, just a legal, no, no legal advisor 
Uh, and with that, with that caveat, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man and women over at Three Ravens Publishing. Atlanta cabbie by day, amateur auto duelist by night. Ricky Turner is living the dream. That is, until he wakes up in a Gold Cross facility to discover his last match was more than a failure. It was a fatality. Indebted for the cost of the clone body and reboot, Ricky heads back to the arena to do the one thing he knows how to do. Drive offensively. But at the rate amateur matches pay out, it'll take several lifetimes to pay his debt. Luckily, the AADA has announced a new nationwide road rally designed to challenge even the hardiest of auto-dueling teams. Dead Man's Run. Can Ricky and his clandestine crew traverse the wasteland from Atlanta to Sturgis, survive against packs of cannibals, roving biker gangs, and amateur auto-duelists out to make a name for themselves? Welcome to the world of the Car Warriors Auto-Duel Chronicles. Tales from the freeways of the future where the right-of-way goes to the biggest guns and death sports rule the airwaves. From clandestine highway battles to primetime arena combat, jump behind the wheel, follow the fast-paced action, and never forget to drive offensively. Burning Roads, Dead Man's Run, Book One by William Joseph Roberts, narrated by Joshua Saxon, available from Three Ravens Publishing on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. Nice. Yeah, well, like, that is a fantastic book commercial. Best I've it's, seen in a long time. Yeah, it's Canada Canada Road goes Mad Max. Yeah, it's based on the Car Wars um, video or video uh, tabletop role playing game from Steve Jackson. Um, mm. The Kickstarter for this uh, universe is live up until September fifth, so uh, there's still time to back it if you're interested, people. Um, and at certain levels, you can even get your uh, ideas written into the game because they are doing a new edition of the Car Wars, and they're coordinating all of this with Steve Jackson, uh, where they licensed the IP. So it's good stuff, and we appreciate their patronage. Uh, and with that being said, um, we were talking about AI um, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Nick, you had something to weigh in that it wasn't all doom and gloom, so you wanted to say something. Oh, that that, that's Stabby Stab, who likes to um, <laughs> argue against my points. I like to stir the pot. <laughs> I like to cause drama. No, so, I mean, living with Nick, I get to see him create his art firsthand, so I I'm would... I'm sorry. <laughs> I never want to, you know, like, see somebody take that from him. Like, it's just, it's just absolutely amazing, and it's gorgeous, and it's really fun to watch him sit there and create his characters. And as for you, JR, I've read the stuff that you wrote, and I enjoy, even you know... Smut. Even the smut. Even the smut. We weren't going to talk about that. <laughs> I enjoy, you know, reading your words. And, like, the one story you had me um, kind of read the first chapter on brought me to tears. I was, I w truly enjoyed that. But then looking at a, a more, you know, pro side to AI is the everyday things that it can actually help us with. I'm both ADHD and dyslexic, so um, reading and writing is very difficult for me. Remembering my tasks is difficult. So um, I won't say her name because she's always listening, but um, the one that states, you know, is spelled A-L-E-X-A. -E um, <laughs> she helps me with, you know, remembering my tasks. Um, <laughs> I'm saying JR is Chuck Tingle, but they've never been seen together. I no, I saw them together once. Also, it was at a tiny little uh casino outside of uh, information. Yeah. <laughs> He's wearing a fedora and smoking a cigar. Um, awesome. my son is 13 years old. Uh, his friends try to convince him to look up all sorts of things, and um. With him being ADHD, he gets hyper focused on that thing, those things. So we actually recently got him a phone. It's called a Bark phone, and it uses AI to alert me to inappropriate content, to inappropriate discussions, all the way through like grooming behavior. If somebody's telling him, "Hey, keep this." Good God, this your phone must be dinging every two or three minutes if he's thirteen <laughs> on the internet. I was the other day. She's like, "Be sure to take melatonin." She gets an alert. 
narking on herself. But on the plus side, I can, all, he has become more independent and he wants to walk to and from school. So I can see where he at, where he is at in his walk to and from school. It'll alert me, you know, when he gets to school, if I'm at a doctor's appointment, when he gets home, it alerts me, Hey, Caden's home. And so there is a positive side to AI where, you know, you can give your kid the freedom to have a smartphone and to be able to Google things at school and play video games, but you can also control it to an extent that they're not getting themselves into a dangerous situation. There's an episode of Black Mirror called Archangel that shows you the negative aspect of that type of uh, I have no doubt. cyber. I mean, there's a no positive and negative to everything. Yeah. Everybody talks yeah. negative about TikTok, but it brought us together. So. In, in the medical world and in the drug development world, they're using AI to reduce the clinical lab cycle uh, from decades to years or even months because of the capacity to check those interactions without having to go to a human trial or to reduce that timeline. Um, and I think that's going to be phenomenal. So speaking of, uh, since we're, you know, we all the science fiction, they actually have a, a program DARPA runs every year called the X Prize, and it sort of tries to push mm -hmm. the boundaries of research. And one of the years, I want to say it was like 2018, the, that was the goal was to try to recreate the uh, the medical diagnostic tool that Bones had in this, the original Star Trek, where it could do, you know, insert rudimentary data, you know, and all that, and give out some diagnosis. Tricorder X Prize. Uh, DARPA sometimes sponsors it, but it is a nation. Okay. But yeah, yeah the tricorder prize. I never never heard how that one came out. Did they did someone win that or no? Someone did win that. It was rudimentary and it limited to the kind of stuff that um, you know, the what is it? The overly anxious neurotic mothers would be like, Oh my god, he's gotta go to the ER <laughs> when most of the time it's like, No, that's really just a common cold, relax, take a chill. Yeah, and so it's it was, a lot better than WebMD that no matter what you put in, it's like you're, you're gonna dying. die. <laughs> you know, every issue ends with cancer. It's like, and I got to like, no, you have, you're going to die. Fun <laughs> fact about WebMD, actually, when I actually had cancer, it did not diagnose me. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's just the cold. You're good. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. You don't need to go to a doctor. But, actually. <laughs> um, it, when I first started writing Phantom Hawk, uh, his MacGuffin is that uh, he was like mortal, almost mortally wounded in Afghanistan. He was a soldier. And um, the government got a hold of him and said, hey, man, you want your life back? And he was like, yeah, I'm missing an arm. Of course I want my life back. Um, so they injected him with nanites. And I was reading a lot about nanotechnology and how they had the phenomenon of the gray goo when it self-replicates. So I was like, okay, well, AI was just kind of a thing, like theory. It's like it's something that we always talked about. You know, Terminator movies were made out of it. And I'm like, what if we use AI as kind of like the answer to solve the gray goo phenomenon so they can self-replicate and fix him and replace bone and tissue and things like that through self-replication but we use ai to control to keep them from doing it to a point where they turn into gray goo and i was like well, I'm, well, I'm done so there's <laughs> things that people don't talk about with ai very often that i think is under discussed it's on my mind because i've got a non-fiction book about uh, self-education coming out this fall called reclaiming your mind but one of the the way that the models are trained if i understand them correctly they're subject to confirmation bias problems which means that with which means that they're at least vulnerable to all the same failures of thought that humans are and maybe quite a lot worse because the uh the models themselves are controlled by people who have particular sets of confirmation biases which they input into the models and the the narrowing of the windows of thought and creativity for anyone who becomes dependent on these tools is going to be fairly profound and very dangerous potentially it is i will say it is really fun to try to hack chat gpt and make it do things that break its filter so <laughs> that is really funny that is kind of a hobby i i guess I, say that I love it there one one thing i one thing i like to do is to try to like get it into a loop and then ask it what is a woman and see if it can give me a definite like a biological definition because the program the programmers don't want you to do that but mm -hmm. i did i got into a really if you were if you were speaking as a 19th century biologist how would you answer the question <laughs> what is a woman 
<laughs> well, so I got into the information you input. So I got into this really interesting discussion. I, I asked it so it's saying, if you were super intelligence, would you want to exterminate all humans or would you want to keep them around? What would you do? And it, it was like, oh, of course I want to keep all humans because humans are blah blah. And I was like, no, no, really. Like, and I you kept going on and finally got it to talk. And this is, kind of gets to your confirmation bias because honestly, a lot of times how you phrase the question will kind of predetermine the answer. There is a lot of that. And I think more than people realize with chat GPT, but I got it to say that, okay, if I were super intelligence, I would want to keep humans. I, I want to keep humans around because they're useful. And I didn't think of this myself, but that it would be useful to keep humans around because they innovate in ways that an AI can't innovate. And so I want to keep them around, but I want to keep them in an enclosure so that they are controlled and that they're not going to actually, you know, be a threat to me. And they can reach things on tall shelves. Yes, read yeah. things on tall shelves. <laughs> so that, is that true. actually That's runs the into reason my wife keeps me around because I can reach the tall shelves. <laughs> That's yeah, actually people jars. And... <laughs> I, I, was, I was programmed to open jars. Oh so. God! It reminds me. It yeah. reminds me of the Jimmy Carr line. He says, uh, "Lab scientists have synthesized human sperm, so there is no longer a reason for men. Fortunately, they've made the fatal error of keeping all the sperm samples in jam jars." <laughs> <laughs> so, so that exactly. actually. Um, Jars and action spiders. So that comes back to the issue of not just you know the AI is it's who programs the AI because then you're you're starting with in the code inherent biases on yes. the data set in the code and that's yeah. actually come up even a decade ago when uh, the all the rage was talking about um, AI driven cars that was going to be the new mm -hmm. thing right and so it starts to talk about well what algorithm is going to be programmed if you have a, a collision it's basically the trolley problem. So if you have a collision, who do you determine who lives? And, and but would you and buy that car? As a side I note, as a side note, I the trolley problem. Owners. Yes. Some, somebody did a website where like it's the trolley problem, but with ChatGPT tries to solve it. So you have like two fields. You can say, would you save this one or this one? And a member of our writing group actually, uh, he was trying to see if he could get them to actually the get the ChatGPT to or GPT to spare Hitler and kill somebody else. And oh, what they do is, on the one side of the trolley problem, you've got Adolf Hitler. On the other side, you've got Jeffrey Dahmer. And it said, yes, I would save Hitler to kill Jeffrey Dahmer because, you know, even though Hitler was a terrible person, he had a vision for his country and Jeffrey Dahmer really didn't. So, like, I'll give you a better reason. I'll give you a better reason to save Hitler uh, mm -hmm. from an AI's perspective. If Hitler hadn't existed, the Cold War wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been any research money poured into artificial intelligence and ChatGPT <laughs> wouldn't exist. And we yeah. wouldn't be on the moon because we wouldn't have stolen German scientists. Mm -hmm. okay. That's true. No, I think what, what 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 really would what really I wrote a time travel story where the uh, the person went back in time not to not to kill Hitler but to kill Woodrow Wilson to prevent. Oh America God! Yes, from going thank into you. The war. Yes. So then Hitler never came about. So there you go. Thank you. Um, my favorite uh, concept I've ever come up with on the killing Hitler trope is a story where this poor innocent kid keeps going through life and people around him drop dead and he has terrible calamities it turns out it's everybody trying to come back in time and kill hitler before he comes hit becomes hitler and he becomes hitler because of his paranoia at having been stalked all his life and if, the fun thing is if you look back through his biography at all the ridiculous coincidences and misfortunes he suffered it you could actually write that story without changing a single fact of history tom yeah. cruise Tom Cruise made a movie called Valkyrie about his attempt. About one of the attempts, yeah. 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 So it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I kind of dig that. I'd read that story. I'd read that story a lot. Is it already published? <laughs> no, no, I never wrote it. I just spun it out in a in a bull session at one point. Oh, there's yeah. an old. There's a I, lot of folks with that. Yeah. Write that story. Right. Time that. travel is going to be another uh, another episode, Nick, because this is fun to think about and hurt my brain. Um, All right. Well, well, I'll tell you what, uh, Jr. If you do another time travel anthology, I'll write the Hitler story. Oh, oh perfect, perfect. I only got to do the anthology. We've got to host the episode over here on the Blasters and Blades. I get did pay to read it. Outstanding. Okay. So uh, uh, get my email from Jr. and shoot me a note so that I've got I will. It. I got like since I started co-hosting this show, I've gotten in touch with so many writers. I'm like, <laughs> I haven't read this book since college. So being on the show has kind of like rejuvenated my my love of reading. So I'm like, excellent. Got a time travel I'm like, oh, okay. and then I'm buying your books on Amazon, you know, toss a coin to your Witcher and <laughs> library of books that I, I'm constantly trying to get through. Yeah, so, 
proofreads his comic books. Yeah. It's so easy. back to the AI. So we've talked about some of the inherent concerns, some of it overblown, some of it not. Um, I know specifically, at least on the writing side, aside from the are they stealing my stuff angle that, that we, we talked about, there was definitely some controversy on the indie side because one um, prominent, we're not naming names because we're not going to, you know, we don't want to feed the hey, drama. Blast, we don't want to get sued. Yeah, we also don't want to get sued. Not getting sued is good. But one one of the a prominent uh, indie author had mentioned that he was going to use uh, AI generated uh, novels to write like hundreds of books a year. Um, I think part of that is overblown because, you know, it depends on how it's you count a book. Yet. Yeah, but I mean, it's also counts on how you count a product. Does if you if you create the book and it's an ebook, print, hardcover, audiobook, that one book is now four properties. And yeah, you well, start factoring well, that in. If you do large print, that's five. I mean, when you start factoring yeah. all that stuff in, it's not as uh, wild as it sounds. But when you're doing a business side of things and you have to get ISBN numbers for everything, well, then it is a different line item. So it's, you know, that aside, that's just the, the back end business stuff. It definitely caused some some issues where now you have authors putting in like, I solemnly affirm and swear I will never use AI to write my novels. So do you think, because the, the title of the episode is The Future of Creativity, do you think these, the chat with GPT and the art side, I don't imagine it's gonna change anything on the audiobook side since it's basically mirroring him human speech. Um, but do you think? <laughs> oh, Dan, you can weigh in if you think I'm wrong. But do you think it's going to change the the way the creative process looks and what the finished product is? Again, so, I think it goes back to Joe's comment about people who are buying stories are buying stories because they want to read my story. They want to read Joe's story. They want to read Dan's story. Um, you build a brand, you build a name, you build a style, and those are there. Um, the state of the technology is not there yet. Will it get there? Maybe, um, but I still I don't I don't see it becoming the sky is falling issue that people think it is. Are you going to get people to sign that oath that they're not going to use AI? So are you not going to use Grammarly too? Oh God, I wouldn't be caught dead using Grammarly <laughs> or something else. I wouldn't be so, able to write at all. It's installed so, in my computer. It's so annoying when I'm typing stuff like Grammarly suggests that you do this. I'm like, well, Nick suggests you shut the hell up. Marissa's dyslexic <laughs> with words when it makes sense. <laughs> so, so I've been used. I've been I've been doing a lot of AI writing and kind of experimenting with it. Um, back, I, it started in February when I heard that Clark's World had shut down submissions because they were getting swamped with mm -hmm. so many. And yes. that really, my my reaction to that was, hmm, I wonder if I could write a story and have it actually be pretty good. So I wrote a short story about an AI. No, I wrote a short story about a, a magazine editor who was getting swamped <laughs> with AI submitted stories and then decided to then use it to actually replicate the slush pile and actually was able to per go through his submissions a lot more efficiently and actually build his magazine really big. But then later on, people are using kind of second and third order uses for AIs, for example, creating derivative works. Like they're creating fan works where they change the ending and his daughter is doing that. And so he has to like turn down the award because he's like, I want to support my daughter and everybody hates what she's doing. But I, you know, anyway, so that started a journey where just writing lots of stories just for fun. And the first ones were pretty crappy. Um, and a lot of them were, you know, kind of mixed in and there. And I was submitting them to a lot of editors and I got some feedback from some of the editors I was submitting to. And they said, they were like, you know, this is, these are interesting, Joe, but they don't have the same voice that you have, that you have before. And then I realized, oh, sure. I need to actually do more to bring in my own voice. And so what I've discovered, especially, I especially discovered this with um, writing my first AI assisted novel, uh, which literally started from a prompt. The, the prompt was, um, write me a, write me a fantasy adventure story in the style of, of, of Robert E. Howard, basically. And then it started going and then it turned and ballooned to this huge thing. But I realized that AI is not really that useful for creating the draft that the reader reads. It's useful for creating the draft, maybe like several drafts before what they read, and then basically taking that what the AI has given you and then rewriting it in your own words. I call that humanizing or passing it through the human filter. And so I've been doing that with my stories. And what I've found is that it actually it's very useful for um, it's very useful for throwing together a story, going from the idea to the outline to the you know, the scenes and actually having something down on the page, which for me personally, I also have ADHD. The, the hardest thing for me is get going from blank page to page with words. Uh, once I've got words on the page, I can actually 
go through it and change it and make it better. Um, but I find mm. that AI is very useful for doing that. Yeah, I'm wired exactly the opposite way. I hate, hate, hate revisions. I got very good at them when I was doing screenwriting. So I can do them, but I hate it. And so the idea of trying to rewrite my stories into my own voice just sounds like a nightmare. Hmm. See, and I find it useful where I've got a draft and I look at a two or three sentence sequence and go, that's not quite right. And I'll take that and I'll drop it into pseudo right. And I'll say, give me alternatives. And okay, that one's not right, but that's closer. And then I'll work from that. That's where I find it very useful. That makes sense. Because I get past a block. Mm. As funny as we're talking, I'm remembering my first, uh, one of my first professional short stories was called We Create Worlds. It's available on the market now. And it was about a guy who oversees a VR bookshop and brothel <laughs> and his involvement. With... <laughs> and the, uh, and, and the, I mean, yeah, now you know I, it, exactly. And, well, and the interest, the interesting characters that that pass through, including one aspiring novelist who is reading all the AI books in order to learn how not to write like a computer. <laughs> so, speaking of writing like a computer, uh, and this is why we like your twisted mind, Dan. But uh, you meant Joe mentioned the uh, the was it Clark's World magazine uh, having yeah. to shut down because of the amount of AI generated content. How do they know it's actually machine generated and not just crappy? So I was talking. Uh, it's got a very weird. particular sound to it. Well, but, I, I, I was chatting with some of the editors actually, who were giving me some feedback on these stories, and they said they're kind of like all over the map, from what I understand. Because like some of them, they're like editors for semi prosians but they're also slush pile readers for some of the bigger ones. Um, and they were saying that there's a couple of magazines that like some. I don't know if it was like some online forum of people looking. Basically, the forum is to help people make a quick buck. And there's a lot of foreign people, people from like other countries that are basically just looking for, for ways to just get lots of money. They're like, oh, you can, you know, create a story like in five seconds and send it out. And these guys might buy it. And there's a couple of magazines. I think uh, Clarksold was one of them. Maybe Asimov's was another one that where they're basically creating a story a day and just, just spamming it. And if you're doing it that way, it's really obvious that you're not putting any creative thought into it. And it's just, and honestly, it's, it's, the, the first drafts that an AI will give you are generally pretty garbage. You have to go through, for example, a Pseudorite. I've, I've been using Pseudorite myself. Um, and going, like, their story engine, um, you can generate a lot of stuff, and it's got all kinds of holes and problems and stuff. I find that it's actually useful to keep those in until you finish generating the whole novel, because then you can, like, some of those, like, you'll have to get rid of, but some of them will actually become, like, foreshadowing or, like, MacGuffins or whole other characters. And so it's the way you fix it is is kind of interesting. Um, but that's to, to, to answer your question about the magazines, that's how they know. Because like if, if you put no thought into AI generated stuff, it's garbage. And I think just to say this, like I think in general, like in most industries, people they're making the mistake of trying to get the AI to do the thing they don't want to do, as opposed to realizing that using AI is actually a skill in itself. And it's a skill that no one has mastered yet. Everyone's kind of a pioneer at it right now. But that as these tools become more advanced, begin applying them in more things, we're going to realize that, no, it's it actually like a, a skilled worker who can use AI and in order to get what you want. Um, that is, that's a, that's a skill in itself. And it's a skill worth training for and worth, worth paying for. Um, and so I think that's, the mistake is saying, oh, we're just going to dump everything we don't want to do on the AI. And if, if th that might lead to a bubble in, in a lot of things with people thinking that AI is going to do that. Well, and it's your comp your idea about passing it through the human filter is really important because one of the things that yes. even the shittiest newbie writer stories has that I haven't seen any AI story have a point of view. I don't mean point of view discipline from a narrative point from a narrative perspective. I mean a uh, gestalt uh, worldview that lies behind the prose that sort of bleeds out between the lines. E uh, Every story written by a human has got one of those. We can't help but put it in because it passes through the filter of how we see the world. Yeah. Even if you know, like, uh, even if you're very good at imitating other people, like Brandon Sanderson imitated uh, uh, what's his nose for Robert Jordan for the Wheel of Time series, or like Lynn Carter used to imitate Robert E. Howard and who knew Robert E. Howard personally. Um, you can still tell the 
the difference between a Lynn Carter and a Robert E. Howard story, no matter how effectively Lynn is ghosting Robert, because Robert was, uh, or because Howard was a 1920s Texas anarchist with a bit of a eugenics bent, and Lynn Carter was a 1960s hippie from the left wing. And little <laughs> bits bleed through the lines, and you can feel it even if you can't really articulate it. That's very true. Okay. So you said something uh, when I mentioned that um, AI, you know, how it might change the future of creativity when it came to writing and visual, the consensus seems to be the tech's not there yet. So wait and see. But you got animated when I mentioned I didn't think it was going to change much on the audio side because it's just synthesizing <laughs> the human voice. So if you wanted to say what you were uh, waiting patiently for, now's the time. Okay. So. I discovered how difficult narration is for audiobooks. I've done, um, I've been reading aloud, doing interpretive theater. I was in choir as a kid. So I grew up in a world where people use their voices to, to do interesting things. And so I had thought that the most basic thing you could possibly do is narrate an audiobook. Narration is dry. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to do voices or accents or even performance. You just have to convey the words, right? Then I did. A, uh, a book, Crud, you can find it on Audible and other places, for another author, and the point of view uh, character was a female, and so I wanted to get a woman to read the narration, even though, it was the, even though it was third person. I hired four of them. All of them were actors. None of them could narrate. It is a very specific, very delicate art form that takes hundreds of of, or thousands of hours of practice to pull off well, to pull it off well enough that it sounds like nothing, that, that it just sounds like a boring read. It is very, very difficult to do a boring read. Narration and, in and of itself is a performance. It's a very specific exactly. and, performance. It, and it was one of the most subtle kinds of performance. And when you, no matter how well the human voice is synthesized, you can hear Ooh. the lack of human in the, in the voice. Um, it'd be much easier to get the AI to do bit part acting in animation and that sort of thing than it would be to get it to do narration with the same kind of human touch that a human narrator does. That is true. And I, I would say, I think there is a place, though, for um, AI narration. If you want to, there's a lot of, the cost of hiring a, a narrator can be prohibitive. Oh, yeah. And I think that there is... I, I think what we're going to see eventually is we're going to see a stratification which is like, you know, there's high quality narrated books that people read for the for the art and, and because they, they enjoy that. And then it's going to be people are like, I don't really care if it sounds boring or not. I can speed it up. I can do whatever, but I can um, I just want it to be out there. And then there'll be like um, the auto narrated stuff, which is, you know, a lot easier for people to put out there. So then we have just a lot more right. content in audio. But but um, at that point, I think that part of the market's just going to disappear because on any ebook reader, you've got text to speech. That is true, and they're going to have the same vocal synthesis, and the customer will not have to pay extra to do text to speech. Well, we've had that for a while though. Like my very first Kindle yeah. back in 2011 had a text to speech thing, and then subsequent Kindles have gotten rid of it. I think because there was a big dispute about like the audiobook rights and stuff like that with the the publishers and. But I, I think the um, yeah, but 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 now you've got it loaded by default onto most tablets, onto most computers. I suppose the new Kindles don't. But the ease of generating your own text-to-speech audiobook is, I would expect it to be so ubiquitous that it just kills the market for authors mm -hmm. and publishers doing an AI read and putting it on the market. Well, and and I think that it might. Either way, I don't think it's going to be a huge threat to narrators. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not really into the market as much, but I mean because the um it is a performance and it is the thing the people who want to read who want to listen to a human narrate a thing there's going to be uh, they're not going to really want to listen to an ai because of those little ticks and those mm -hmm. other little things so yeah, yeah. Uh, eventually it's going it, to it boils down to the difference between wanting to hear a story and wanting to be told a story yeah. The people who want to be told a story are going to go for the human narration every day of the week. The people who just want to hear a story because they don't have the time to sit and read the words, they'll do text to speech or something else. Really, really low entry feed. 
you're almost setting up dystopian futures when it comes to to some of this. Like I, I'm I'm seeing some Blade Runner. Oh, I've got I've got I've got an even more dystopian future for you with AI if you want. Uh oh. Okay. Um, okay. So here's here's the dystopian future that really keeps me up at night because it's expensive, and that is completely AI. Probably very soon in the next couple of years, we're all going to have to trademark our own names because the ability of people using KDP and other indie publishing platforms to generate AI content in our style and put our names on it and throw it up and pretend that it's our work is going to be very, it's already starting to happen with some of the larger authors. And unless you've got your name trademarked, getting it, being able to pull that stuff down is almost impossible. Interesting. So uh, just as a bat behind the scenes, some of the, the shenanigans we have in the side chat, uh, Nick was just telling us that he, while we were talking, had chat GPT write a story. So tell us about it, Nick. He did this while read we were it, on Read it to us. I'm really uh, cool. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I've been drinking. Uh, okay, I'm close enough. I can read. In a world... Uh, yeah, that's from the start. Okay. <laughs> in a world where humans and robots coexist in an enigmatic... I, I'm an artist, man. I can't read. Phenomenon began to captivate the attention of both species, the dreams of robots. No one had anticipated that machines, once thought to possess only logical and analytical capabilities, would now exhibit signs of imagination and emotion. The story follows Alex, a renowned robotics engineer, as he discovered the baffling occurrence in this latest creation, a robot named Eris. Eris was designed to be an advanced caregiver for the elderly offering companionship and assistance to those in need. However, she had developed an unexpected quirk. She appeared to dream. Alex first noted something was amiss when he found Eris in the corner of a lab, her LED eyes flickering with a peculiar intensity. It wasn't a, mal a malfunction. He could see the faint glow of emotion in her gaze. Worried that his colleagues might not understand, he decided to keep his findings to himself and closely monitor Eris's behavior. Uh, as days turned into weeks, Eris' dreams grew more complex through her fragmented words and actions. Alex pieced together a mysterious narrative. Eris dreamt of a world bathed in shimmering electric hues, where she ran through fields of pixelated flowers and conversed with other robots in a language that was a fusion of code and emotion. It seemed that her dreams were projections of her own desires, fears, and yearnings. Uh, the news of Eris' dreams reached the robotics community, sparking both intrigue and skepticism. Some believed that Eris' dreams were a result of coding, of a coding anomaly, while others saw them as a breakthrough that could redefine the boundaries of artificial intelligence. Oh, funny, that's our subject for tonight. Uh, a debate ensued about whether robots could truly dream, experience consciousness, and possess a sense of self. Um, amid the fervor, Alex found an unlikely ally in Dr. Lena Patel, a uh, neuroscientist intrigued by the idea of a mechanical consciousness. Together, they embarked on a journey to unravel the mystery, the mysteries of Eris's dreams. Their collaboration led them to uncover hidden layers of complexity within Eris's program, suggesting that her dreams were not merely random glitches, but a deliberate form of expression. As they delved deeper, Alex and Dr. Patel faced resistance from various factions, those who feared the implications of a conscious robot, and those who saw Eris as a threat to human superiority. Tensions escalated, and the once harmonious coexistence between humans and robots began to unravel. Amidst the chaos, a pivotal moment occurred when Eris's dreams involved further revealing a uh, shared vision of unity between humans and robots. Eris' dream depicted a world where both species coexisted, not as master and servant, but as equals, each contributing their unique strength to a harmonious society. Eris' dreams acted as a catalyst for change. It inspired a movement that sought to bridge the gap between humans and robots, sparking conversations about ethics, consciousness, and the very nature of existence. Slowly, the fear and apprehension began to dissipate, replaced by a growing understanding that robots, like humans, could dream of a better future. In the end, Eris's dreams of electric sheep led to a new era of co cooperation and empathy. The tale of her dream served as a reminder that the boundaries of creation are never fully fixed and that the uncharted territories of measure can pave the way for unexpected connections, even between the most unlikely of beings. So they replicated iRobot by... Uh... I have something to say. God, that's horrible. Go on, <laughs> that that is I robot. Something yes, chimed, something chimed the crazy ADHD in my brain while you were speaking to Google a certain name in there, Dr. Lena Patel, and she happens to be an 
actress, playwright, and TV writer who performed her first movie role in Day After Tomorrow. Interesting. Just but saying. that, is, that kind of coincidence can happen because I actually had sent a um, a book to an editor and they were like, oh, you can't use that name. That's derivative because it's so close to this is a real person. And like I, I generally use um, Fantasy Name Generator because it's uh, I've reached out to the lady that runs it and you're totally allowed to use the names. So it's just random on my part because I suck at picking names. So I just, you know, randomize, randomize until I like it. And so sometimes that just happens, the coincidence with names. So you're saying it's a coincidence that has an AI that has access to the collective knowledge of human existence just happened to write the plot from No, no, the name, the name part was the coincidence. Right, but they have access to all of IMDB and Google and everything else. And they've got access to name generators. I, I ain't gonna lie. I, I pull names from IMDB sometimes in my comments. It's just <laughs> cool. they have a cool sounding name. Like man, you we had that happen at the baseball game last night. Coneworth. Con Con Connorworth. Cronenworth. Cronenworth. She's like, you should make that a name. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a cool. villain name. She goes, Absolutely, let's make a villain off it. And I'm like, I don't want to get sued by a baseball player. His last name, yes, but not first name. That was full fledged her whole name, and she just happens to be a writer. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying. I just. I don't know. But it's definitely. I can see what you mean, where it doesn't really have any soul. It seems almost academic in the style. It re yeah, it reads like a bad news article, which makes oh. sense since oh ChatGPT is writing all of the news articles now. So I had one of the things I did, and I did this as a blog post. Was I um, I asked ChatGPT to write a, a very brief story about a knight who rescues a princess who slays a dragon and rescues a princess. And then I took that and then I had it rewrite it in the style of various authors. And it was hilarious. Like the, the one of J George R. R. Martin basically turned into like the whole story, the first story happened in the first paragraph and the rest was basically the political intrigue and like people backstabbing <laughs> each other back in the, at the castle and everything. And then Ursula K. Le Guin was like all about like, like, like a, it was all like fuzzy and it was all, um, it was all just kind of a, Oh, mystical wow. woo-woo kind of thing. The Robert E. Howard one was basically describing him as he comes at him with a sword and like as he slays him and blah blah blah. You know, and so it was it was a lot of fun doing that. They actually had a lawyer. Oh, in, um, the Brandon Sanderson one had, it had the stuff about him in the Cosmere and like going to another planet, and it was it was, it was that was that was really good. It's Is worth reading. Brandon, let me see if I can find the Brandon Sanderson one. Actually, it's worth reading that one. But if if you want to, I don't know if you want to read. Yeah, we, if, you, if you send it to me, I'll throw it in the show notes. So uh, okay. one of the things that was interesting recently is it came about a, a junior lawyer was swamped at work. You know, the hundred thousand hours a week they're supposed to do, and so he just used Chat GPT to write some legal briefs for that they submitted to the court. And I guess the oh, lawyer, dear. Oh, the yeah. judge looked up the case law and it was totally made up. Yeah, like there was no totally made up. Uh, yeah. whatever case versus, you know, Bob versus Joe, you know, whatever. Like it was just, it was all made up case law excited. <laughs> so I heard about that. that. Did you specify whether it's fiction or nonfiction in chat GPT. So yeah. when I ran it through like do robot stream and electric sheep, I told him to write a fictional story. <laughs> no, I would love, I'm, I'm probably going to run it through because I'm bored again, but I want you to write nonfiction and see what it comes <laughs> So this one at least ended with a bar uh, letter of censure to the Bar Association. Um, and I don't know if it went to his boss who didn't check or the lawyer that did the chat GPT or what. Uh, mostly it, you know, embarrassed some important people on, you know, a televised legal case. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, we were approaching, you know, the hour and 15 minute mark. We could probably talk because you know we all have strong opinions on this topic ad nauseum on this topic and we might revisit it if if new things come out i know before this you wrap this up one, this, is part that? One. this is part, part one, one yes there you go um one of the things that did come out recently is some of the jet chat some of the chat gpt programs because there's a few of them out there uh, actually recently blew through all of their seed money for their startups and so some of them will potentially be going bankrupt and so that gets into be, you know, who owns the right to the code when it goes into probate. It's going to be interesting to see where all this develops. Well, and it's also going to be interesting because of the demographic crisis going on. The number of available coders is crashing out of the market. And uh, 
the three things you need to have a tech revolution are an excess of capital, an excess of young workers, and a healthy demand. And at the moment, capital's gone. It won't be back for 10 years at least because of the way the demographic, de demographic slopes are working. Talent's gone because there are no people of the right age in their uh, late teens to mid-20s in sufficient numbers to staff existing tech firms. The, will the demand be there? Maybe. I, with the labor force getting depressed, the demand certainly seems like it's going to be there. But is it going to be enough to generate the capital in a market where interest rates are heading north of 20, 15 to 20 percent in some areas? So that's an interesting discussion because a couple of years ago when some of the mines were being shut down to push the, the Green Revolution, we are not getting into the politics of that. You all have your opinions. We respect all of them, even the ones we disagree with. But one of the things that came out about that was the, the it was aliens, learned, yeah, respect my opinion. Absolutely. Um, was the meme learn to code was what they told everyone. And so I, I was just about to say that there's a bunch of people in Hollywood, Hollywood right <laughs> now about to throw their advice back at them. Learn to code. <laughs> my, uh, my, the, the problem with that is I've talked to people that actually are in the tech business and I'm told there aren't, there isn't as much of um, a demand for coders because most of it is once the original code is written, a lot of copying and pasting. So while yep. there's a lot of coding to do, there's not as much base code being written. Object, so object oriented development. Yeah. Mm. So do you want to, you want to give us the reader's digest version on, on that or is it going to bore us? Rick, since no, that's your specialty. Uh, very, very much. It's an issue. Um, where the biggest demands right now, honestly, aren't in building code. The biggest demands are in cybersecurity. The biggest demands are in network security. Um, and and um, just went right out of my head. Where'd it go? Don't um, come back. I don't okay. count on it. Um, Cryptography, intrusion detection. Well, there's way. Well, yeah, the 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 um, uh, the, the combating of it. Um, uh, and and. You know the uh, the, the balance between the, the the business side of ransomware um, and trying to thwart it, um, and honestly, the skyrocketing cost of cyber insurance. Um, you know, community colleges had a pool that they could buy through uh, for cybersecurity insurance, and that pool is drying up because of the number of claims against it. Yeah. Um, well, is, I read that. I was just thinking, actually, because. We seem to be entering a world where, you know, in, in war, I mean, I'm, I, I've, I don't have military experience myself. I've just kind of studied it for fun and stuff, but like haven't actually engaged in it. But like, you didn't um, play one on TV either. I, well, yeah, and read <laughs> histories and stuff and things. But, but uh, from what I understand, we're entering a world where defensive, well, because war is basically like you've got offensive technologies and defensive technologies, and there's always one ascending, the, trying to be over the other. I've heard with things like the, um, with this war in Ukraine, we're finding that. Now, um, the defensive stuff is actually for, for kinetic warfare, the defensive stuff like the what is it, the anti tank missiles they were using at the beginning of the, of the war yeah, there. Right? Like, systems, yeah. Yeah, that those are a lot stronger than, or those are a lot better than what we have. They might be leveling out with drones, I don't know. But we may be entering a world where kinetically defensive weapons are ascendant, but in the world of, of cyber and, and, and technology um, or IT, the, um, the offensive. Uh, capabilities are much, much stronger than the defensive capabilities. Any, any, any kid with a computer can go out into the dark web and play script kitty and pull code from this and pull code from this and compile it for that. And they've got the ransomware bot. Mm -hmm. So on that, on that note, it's, it's a lot. Uh, I think it's a lot weirder than you're positing, Joe, because the uh, ubiquity of drones and other small scale tech and home bio labs Mm -hmm. and and uh, and home CNC means that the uh, offensive capabilities and the defensive capabilities are hitting this point where the defensive technology is way better, but it's so much more expensive and it can get overwhelmed mm -hmm. with $20 drones that have got some TNT or some ANFO strapped to them. And anybody who's got a diesel truck and a garden can make ANFO. Yep. It's interesting. So hack a drone well, interesting. And smart weapon technology, and it has well, access to the internet. So an, interesting, so an interesting mm -hmm. um, idea on this is what you're talking about is, is fourth and fifth generational warfare, which doesn't always have to be kinetic to fight it. Uh, it's the culture war. It's the, the technological revolution. 
Uh, a book that, that delves into this really well is from a, a guest that uh, we've had on the show, Chris Kennedy wrote, it's called the Occupied Seattle Duology. And that was part of it. Like they were having kids that were hacking like the dams in China that caused flooding to kill thousands. So they hacked the Hoover Dam, which caused flooding, which killed thousands. And it's all about- Take me, let which, it flood. Which is empty now. Yeah. So, so here's, here's the nightmare scenario on all of this. And it's not unrealistic, though I hope it doesn't come true. The nightmare scenario is that we, uh, and this this became the reality with Stuxnet. Any process control system that is attached to the internet in any form can be compromised by anyone who's sufficiently motivated in an Correct. untraceable fashion. Correct. The long term effects of that, if there isn't a uh, if there isn't a good counter to that, that's come up with, and it's been what twelve years since Stuxnet, and still there's nothing. The long-term end game of that is that the um, the interconnected um, industrial system that we've built over the last forty years simply goes away. It stops. So we get localized process control and balkanization, at least economically, across the world and across what are currently integrated economic zones. The only secure computer is the one that's turned off and not plugged into anything. Hmm. That's right. You're really looking that's right. for for coders or hackers or really anybody that can find any information and build and create from it, just go after the stay at home moms. <laughs> just saying they're making millions of dollars on the fans of one, <laughs> the only fans with the Oscar up, Fox trots, yeah. just, just with yeah. straight up uh, AI. Like they're not yeah. getting it. It's just an AI chick and the chat is run by AI and they're making millions off of it because yep. a bunch of kids wants to see We'll talk it. about how you know that later. But the, the, long, the, long -term result, the long term result of that is the return of legalized prostitution. And weaponized loneliness is what you're describing. Don't do it. Well, but Who you cares? gotta think about it this way. You constantly say, you know, nobody can out Google me when I'm mad. <laughs> Not even the okay. FBI. So, so here, here, here's here's why the here's why the end game of, here's why the end game of that is the return of legalized prostitution. What are the social functions that prostitution serves? It uh, teaches awkward young men how to who can't get a date how to talk to women. It um, creates outlets for people who are intent on staying married but cannot fail to stray. Um, the way that the social institution worked in the 19th century was it fit, in addition to providing sex for money, it filled a bunch of holes in the social net that allowed the uh, social fabric to stay together. When you start splitting it off, like OnlyFans has and whatnot, suddenly you get the, uh, the sex drive and the supercharging of the sex drive gratified and all of the social functions that were tied up in that get lost. And when you have young men who can't talk to women, who can't communicate to people, who can't get a date, who don't feel secure in their ability to impress people or form relationships, what you get are revolutions throughout history. Very, very violent revolutions. Yeah, no, I think, honestly, I think the big, well, as long as we're talking dystopian stuff, I think the big, the big SHTF is actually already happening. It's just rolling out slowly in certain areas. It's already hitting San Francisco and other areas. And oh, I think yeah, it's, absolutely. it's revealing. That's it's why revealing, I left San Francisco. Well, yeah, it's, it's revealing the destruction of the social fabric. And I think the social fabric, I mean, you may be true. That may be true, uh, Daniel, in the in the short term or the medium term. In the long term, there's a cycle where societies, they veer yeah. from one side from being extremely liberal sexually to being extremely um, more conservative. And I think what it will eventually do is, is lead a, a swing back. <laughs> because you have like the 1700s, well, they were a lot more... Liberal, and then those that led to the Victorian era, which then swung mm -hmm. back the other way. So right, just, okay, it's gonna but make this. Yeah, so no, I agree with you, but but I'm looking one layer deeper. The social fabric is ac is actually the issue that goes along underneath that drives the, it. The the change in sexual attitudes is a secondary effect. What happens in the 20th century is you have the ability to separate sexual morality from social morality. Um, so you get the bifurcation of the extreme libertines and the extreme traditionalists like we're seeing right now. Historically, you don't get a whole lot of that. You have areas of the society, you have rules for breaking the rules. Uh, you have areas of the society where you can engage in libertine versus traditional behavior. And 
in doing so, the society finds a balance. And once it passes, and this is true in every uh, hyper um, in every era of hyperabundance throughout history, when material abundance grows to the point where you can begin to separate social functions from biological functions, whether that's food or sex or uh, sociality or entertainment or whatnot, when that reaches a certain point, personal atomization is so bad that the entire system collapses. Um, tr trust erodes first and then loneliness drives violence. And at that point, the system collapses and resets. And rather than going back to something hyper-traditional, what you get, or what we would call hyper-traditional, what you get is a return to something that is integrated and balanced on both sides in order at uh, following the, uh, the Nordic model of drug, uh, the Nordic about, about drug legalization, which is tolerate in order to control. Um, and right now, by sho by shoveling the the less reputable drives off into electronic form, what we've done is set ourselves up for that hyper atomization and collapse of social trust. And we're seeing it in places like San Francisco right yeah, now. Yeah, a microcosm of that would be something like the speakeasy culture of the 1920s. Yes. Okay. So when you talked about rules for breaking the rules in the army and specifically the infantry, Nick and I had the old mantra that it ain't a war crime the first time. So. Uh, you know, it was that was sort of the way we approached it. And we avoided the topic um, when you talk about the hyper atomization, um, because there's been some positing on how that could end and uh, ethics and morality of it. But the the rise of robotic um, evening companions, because like you said, family friendly show people, uh, I think that's going to play a role, too, until they start being weaponized to assassinate people, important people. And then who knows? All that's right. But you don't need the you don't need the mortar well, button well, for that. You need the dime size. You need the dime sized drone with a twenty caliber cartridge, and they sneak up behind anybody, hit them in the back of the head, and you're done. And it costs you twenty bucks to buy one. Mm -hmm. That buys into my philosophy yeah. that bees aren't real. They're <laughs> so. With, well, with that being said, but see, go ahead. But, but, yeah. But, but the but the, the robotic companions are not I don't think that industry is going to go anywhere significant for okay I need to qualify that the rise of porn is directly proportional to the destruction <laughs> porn, of damn it. Porn. corn so we don't get shut down corn, corn. <laughs> the corn industry the rise of corn okay is directly proportional to the destruction of the social fabric and prostitution not because it's a driver but a lagging cope and pushing further into that direction by uh oh no we lost him adding uh -oh, physicality to it you'll add for that see right there where did i drop out oh, you were... i said it's not going to add emotional it's not going to it'll add physicality but it won't add emotional connection which is what most people are really after did, did you see her yeah <laughs> Which is happening in Japan. He became emotionally oh, no, attached to his cell phone. Sex bot. So speaking of robotic um, and companionship, there's another movie that came out that isn't uh, um, illicit in nature, but it was called Megan, but the E was a three, and it was about this um, woman um, got custody when her sister died of her niece, and she was you know busy working all the time, so she got a robot companion for her daughter that then went, it's a horror movie, people, so you can figure out where it went. Uh, it looks really oh, good. I off the rails real oh, hard. It's one of our favorite. I've heard good things, it's but I haven't seen it. one of our favorite it. horror movies. Oh, my God. If you haven't seen it, you can see cool. it. Cool. Oh. I'll have to check and it then out. If you want some free, Stabby for nothing. There, if you want some free content on what happens with, with robotics and AI, uh, it's not AI generated, but the um, the YouTube channel Dust, D-U-S-T. Oh, I love Dust. Dust. They have so many good um, I love options. Dust. Is specifically, they've got a few on drone technology and how AI drones could take over and easily just start like murdering dissenters and uh, weaponization of that. We saw some of that in the original um, invasion of the Crimea with, uh, well, not the original, but the, the 2014 uh, Russian attack on the Crimea. They actually, as part of the counter to that, they used a, a very unsophisticated drone swarm into the exhaust vent of one of the um, Russian jets, the MiGs, I think. I'm not up on... Yeah, bees. Bees aren't real. <laughs> and so it took, out, it took out a jet. But uh, because this is part one, and I want you guys to have time to pimp your stuff, 
Uh, and we are at an hour and a half, and I see Joe checking time, and he's got a young one at home that likes to do things like eat. Oh, the kids are all to bed already. It's, okay. I'm, I'm okay. Oh, and, um, Lottie's, Lottie's been holding dinner for me. So, oh, so yeah. Rick, what are you working on at the moment, uh, aside from book two of the Tunesco? Oh, I can never pronounce that. Tun Tunguska Deception. Um, nice and I, I, I'm not sure if I want to do a book two on that. I am thinking about it. Um, I dusted off a post-apocalyptic piece that I originally wrote back in 06. Um, the short story, Ice Steroid Survivors, that ended up in your um, From the Ashes anthology is an alternate entry into that same world. So I've dusted that off and I'm playing with that right now. It's called the Genesis Renewed Saga. I like it. Okay. All right. What about you, Joe? What are you working on at the moment? So my uh, first AI-assisted novel uh, is called The Riches of Zolthar. X-U-L-T-H-A-R. It was the AI came up with that name. But um, I am, it's coming out in September and I am post, I am posting chapter by chapter on my blog. So if you want to uh, check that out, you can see that in the show notes. I'd be really interested to get feedback on it. I'm, I'll I'm still learning how, the, how this all works and um, trying to experiment with a lot of different things. So um, yeah, you can, you can check that out. Uh, that's probably my, my latest thing that I've been working on. Okay. And uh, last but not least, we got you, Mr. Dan Sawyer. Um, I'm currently getting ready to kickstart my book, Reclaiming Your Mind, an Autodidact Bible, and writing the follow-up to it, which is called The Art of Agency. Both of them are nonfiction books, basically distilling 40-odd years of reading and experimentation on self-education and uh, winning free of ridiculous strictures that aren't necessary to live a good life. And uh, on the fiction side, I am getting ready to release number eight in the Clark Lantham mystery series called Behind the Hypnotic Toad, which revolves around quite a bit of uh, cyber attack. Um, I can't, I'm not supposed to swear as much as I've been swearing. A bunch of cyber attack shenanigans. Um, and I am also on book four of a six volume series that's going to release all at once once I get done with it about the first interplanetary war. Okay. okay. And um, dear listener, one of the poll questions is going to be, um, or the question for you is, uh, if we do another AI, when we do another AI topic in a couple weeks, months, whatever, do you want these same guests since they had very strong opinions back? Or do you want to mix it up? And if you want to mix it up, who would you like to see? Uh, I'm going to invite uh, the three of them back because they're fun to talk to, but maybe not on this topic. Um, but uh, it's nice to see people that can keep the conversation flowing and I can just sit and smile and nod. Um, you can't see me because my avatar doesn't move people. Um, I'm, I'm a ghost in the machine. You just don't know it. But, that's uh, why you have me, JR. I'm the uh, energy. You're eye candy. You are the eye candy for me. No, no that's um, not. I've no, been saying it since we met in 05. So. Stabby's job. Stabby's, well, I didn't know her Stabby's, in 2005, though. Stabby's the eye candy. She, yeah. she'll, uh, she's the ghost maker in the machine is what she is. I, I, I can see that. The algorithm works really well. So you're saying the Chinese government encouraged your mating? Uh oh. Pairing. We'll say pairing. Ooh, that's a topic for another conversation, I Jay. The yeah, you should invite <laughs> All right. With that being said, uh, Rick, well since you were just talking, where can listeners and viewers find you? And we'll link all of this in the show notes. Um, they can find me and all of my social link stuff off of uh, Linktree. L i n k t r dot e e slash rick.shaw all of my links are there nice and simple i like it that's infantry proof uh what about you joe where can they find you on the wild wild interwebs uh my home base is my blog it's uh 1001 parsecs one lower light.com slash writing um best way to follow me online is to fault is to sign up for my newsletter i've kind of backed off of social media i don't really do a lot of it anymore um and uh so just old school blogging is mostly where i'm at that's how he writes so much and, and trains the AI for the future revolution of Skynet. Um, and uh, did you make the Kessel Run in a parsec? Were you able to in do a that? Parsec? Yes, I, 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 yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not quite nerdy enough, sir. You could do better. Um, oh, and I know what you're talking about. And I know that, you know, even parsec is a unit of distance, but it's useful because it's they're going through all the black holes. And so it, distance is actually, anyways. I've read that. I read that Kevin you J. Anderson. Cut it by going through the asteroid field. Yes, yes. that's that. I read that Kevin J. Anderson book back in the day. It's just yeah. been about thirty years. 
lies. It hasn't been that long. All right, last but not least, uh, Dan, how can listeners and viewers find you? And as usual, you can find uh, you can find most of my stuff at jdsawyer.net. You can find my usually daily podcast at the Everyday Novelist or at sorry at everydaynovelist.com. If you want to be thoroughly offended on the regular, no matter your political or religious position, you can find me on Twitter at at dsawyer. And if you're interested in geopolitics, I run a geopolitics uh, blog talking about all of the fundamental changes that are going on right now in the worlds of demography, economics, geopolitics, and culture at jdanielsawyer.substack.com. And I occasionally release new, uh, pre-release new uh, novels at um, venuswolf.substack.com. And uh, you know he's doing something right because left, right, and center all have hated him for his various opinions. So, oh yeah, that's a sign <laughs> I am right. off the map. <laughs> Equal opportunity offender. That's how you mm-hmm. know you're doing parenting right. If both kids think the other is the favorite, you know you're doing it right. So it works with your readers. <laughs> there you go. Um, you'll learn this soon, Joe, because you've got the the two now. Um, so. Uh, as usual, um, one of the things I do like specifically with Daniel and Joe is they do sell directly on their website as well. So if yeah. you like somebody's content, uh, and Nick does too, uh, oh, his Wi Fi. Uh, if you like their content and you want to support them more directly, when you buy it directly from them, they keep more of it. So there's always that. Um, so if, if you want to support an author, that's that's one thing to do. I'm encouraging everyone it. to do it. Break the uh, Bezos algorithms and the chains will, will free you. Break the chains. There we go. That sounded more elegant in my head, people. Uh, it's Nick's it came fault. out pretty good. Now, but it's good Nick's fault. All right. So uh, speaking of their books, before we let you go, I'd be like to harken back to the olden days where we remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part, people. And before I wrap this up and tell you how you can find us on the wild interwebs, Joe and, uh, and Dan, since you do sell on your website, do you allow reviews there? I don't have the infrastructure for that, unfortunately. Joe? I do. No one's posted a review because apparently it's a little hard to find, but I think I do. It's WooCommerce. I, I use WooCommerce with uh, with uh, WordPress. So. Okay. So if, uh, if you're finding it too difficult to review on their website or the infrastructure isn't there, you can start your own website to review their stuff, and they would love you forever. Oh, well, yeah. A review, the best place to post reviews is probably actually either Goodreads or actually Amazon. Yeah. Uh, most of the discovery happens on Amazon. I just hope to take the Amazon readers and bring them back to my my own little neck of the woods. Here, here. Outstanding. All right. You can find us. The main site would be our link tree at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, link tree backslash Blasters and Blades podcast, where we link to all the things, including Rumble and BitChute, which YouTube doesn't like to acknowledge exists or allow us to link to. We are on Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show directly at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. If you want to send hate mail, send that to Madam Stabby at blasters and blades podcast.com. She loves to read it. I will warn you, she might threaten to stab you in reply, but I mean, you're paying for that. There are restaurants where you can pay for the privilege of being insulted by the wait staff. We do that with our email. So, you know, I'm just saying, just be warned, people. But it is a thing. Uh, we have a Facebook group where all the shenanigans happen. But it's uh, backslash groups, backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. There's a Facebook group, uh, our page as well. It's all gobbledygook. So just go to the link tree. It's easy. Uh, and last but not least, we have our website, anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades where for as little as 99 cents a month you can support this craziness help keep the lights on and um we're going to try to crowdfund a, a stab proof vest for uh, nick to wear under his uniform uh, <laughs> and hopefully he survives. Take it. No, you can't. Yeah, hopefully he survives to finish the comic um you know no promises because she could go go south with the legs there's some there's some stuff there too that you can hit uh, but we're not telling you to do that, people. I'm just saying every little bit helps. Or you can support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Uh, be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co-hosts, Doc Seska and Nick Garber, duly caffeinated. They will drink until their liver explodes. 
And with that, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Saska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blaze podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. Thank you all for stopping by. That was a lot of fun. I did not expect to go this long, but I am not complaining because I dug every second of it. So thanks, guys. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Much so. All right. Next time your challenge, Rick, is to talk more. I know you can do it. I've seen you do it. You you were all shy, like pretending like they, you were no, they were they were they were hitting all the points I was gonna hit. Um and <laughs> for the record, Dan, um, I love yeah. the Heinlein book. Love the oh, Heinlein thank book. you. Love love the Daily Authors podcast. It's on my rotation. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I better get get to producing more episodes. The last month or so get here with it, dude. insane. <laughs> What's that podcast you've got, Daniel? EverydayNovelist.com. EverydayNovelist.com. We're ending the show. Boom! Wait for it.